Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the probably last event for CSCI 100 this fall. Uh, we've had a number of career talks happen. We've heard from UX people, from an SRE, from software engineers, uh, all sorts of different roles. Uh, today, I'm very excited to have uh, a product manager, Devin, uh, who's a friend of mine from Google and was also just on my team. We worked together for two years. Um, and as, as I was mentioning earlier, Vinaya, who gave the UX talk, was also from our same team. And so you're going to get to hear the product side of the conversation, whereas before you got to hear the UX side and you got to hear my side talking about software engineering. Uh, product engineers, uh, a, a, the product managers often can come from kind of computer science backgrounds and often do at Google. And so this is absolutely a valid path for you uh, if you're taking CSCI 100. Um, and Devin will talk a little bit more about that. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to hand it off, Devin. Take it away. Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Devin Brooks, um, as Alex said, and I am a product manager on the music and premium growth team um, and excited to kind of give you this career talk around um, my version of what I think product management is. So let's, when you talk to people, you'll hear a lot of varying answers around this question. Um, so there is no one universal source of truth, but I'll just give you my perspective on it. Um, what is product management? I did some research and I found this definition I thought was a really good succinct uh, explanation for it. So a product manager is uh, the person who identifies the customer need and the larger business objective that a product or feature will fulfill. Two, articulates what success looks like for that product. And three, rallies a team to turn that vision into a reality. And so, you know, these are a lot of words, but what does this actually mean? Um, so I would say this first bullet point really articulates like the, the product manager really needs to set the vision for the, the product that you're working on. Like, what are the goals that we are trying to achieve by working on this product? Second, once we define the vision, we then look into, okay, what is the strategy that helps us achieve that vision and the roadmap for us to get there? And then third, we then need to execute on all of that. So we've aligned on what is the vision, we've set a strategy, we've defined a set of projects in our roadmap, but now we have to execute against them. And so I think these you know, four distinct um, areas are what help define what a product manager uh, does. And so as I say, vision, strategy, roadmap, and execution. but you'll come to find that product management can take on many different flavors. Um, and it's not necessarily a one size fits all role. So first you might ask yourself, who is your customer? Um, depending on where you work, there's um, I think three general camps that, uh, that folks think of. One is B2B, which means I'm a, I work at a business that sells to another business. And this is usually generally enterprise product management. The second would be B to C, which means I'm a business that sells directly to consumers. And um, our team at the Music and Premium, on the Music and Premium, that's where we would fall in, in that realm and that we sell our product directly to end consumers. And then there's a third middle hybrid version called B to B to C, which means I'm a business that sells to another business that then eventually it sells to a consumer. I know this is, it sounds a bit weird, but a good example of this might be um, a company like Afterpay. So I don't know if you've seen, if you go shopping online, some um, companies have this ability when you check out that says, hey, instead of paying for this upfront, you can pay over this for four monthly payments and finance with this company. So if I'm Afterpay, I sell my product to Banana Republic or J. Crew or Casper. And then Casper then sells that product to the end consumer. And so it takes the lens of who am I actually defining these requirements for and how do I make sure I achieve all the goals for my customers. And in that case, you may have two customers, the business and also that end consumer that will then um, use your product. Uh, the second question you might ask is what is the product? And you'll generally find that products here fall in two camps. One is software and then the other is hardware. And if you decide, to, depending on which track you take, um, the, the role of the product manager can take on a lot of different lenses. Um, and especially your life cycles um, can be much longer or shorter 
If you're software, it might be very easy to push a piece of code and see it live in production within you know, a couple of hours. Whereas hardware, it could take many months for you to do iterations on different hardware prototypes um, and then push something out to the end consumer. And then some companies also do both. They, can, they, they own the full stack and do hardware and software. And so based on that uh, dimension, you might see uh, various flavors um, of what that vision, software, vision, strategy, roadmap, and execution looks like. And then the third piece is what stage is the company that I'm working in? You can start anywhere from an early stage seed uh, startup um, or look somewhere in the middle that um, a, a, a company that's in a high growth phase that's still in the startup. So maybe series C, series D. And then you have a full fledged you know, public company. It's like the Googles, Facebooks, or Meta, I guess now, um, of the world. And so based on that, the role of a product manager can look very different. And a lot of times you can glean what that looks like by having conversations with people either at the company or at various, at the same stages of that company to understand uh, what might be the responsibilities I'd have as a product manager. So kind of setting that context, let's go back to our framework and then apply it to a problem that um, I worked on with Alex and for those of you who saw Vinaya's presentation as well at um, YouTube. So first we're gonna own in on the vision and this is a very, um, I'll say, uh, compressed version of how we might think about these things. But obviously at the end, if there's any questions, we can elaborate more on what these uh, four dimensions look like. So um, I'm a product manager on a product called YouTube Premium, which is a monthly subscription that gives you ad-free YouTube, downloads, being able to listen to um, videos in the background and a subscription to our music service called YouTube Music Premium. So we, we at the premium, you know, we notice we have a problem. You know, over the past year, we've seen that the rate at which users canceled has increased. And so this means we, um, our, our trajectory for our paid member growth and getting more users to subscribe and stay as paying members you know, this is gonna harm us in reaching that business goal. And so this is a problem that we need to solve. And we think about, all right, how, you know, what is our, our high level thinking about how we may accomplish and address this problem? And so we look at kind of our, our lens and toolkit and understand where have we invested over some years and where have we not invested. And, you know, we look internally and say, hey, you know, we really haven't invested in our next generation retention platform to help make sure we keep these users on as long as possible to use our product. So over the next year, we're going to staff up a team and say, hey, retention platform is the path we're going to go to accomplish this problem. We, get, we talk to our stakeholders and everyone's aligned like, yes, let's go uh, invest in a retention platform. But that's a high level, a, a very high level lofty goal. What, what does a retention platform actually mean? So, Let's look at our strategy. There's a lot of different ways you could address retention um, for a product. And so we look at our you know, data and insights. It, this is not accurate data, so um, don't worry. This is no confidential information, but just for representative purposes. We're saying, hey, we've, we've looked and say, how many, you know, I listed many features that, uh, we, that we have in our product. And we noticed that, hey, if users use more of these features, they're more likely to stay on our service. And so that is a really big insight for us. And we know that, okay, if we can get un, help users understand what features we have and make sure they use them, they're more likely to become paying customers for us. So our strategy is in this, by building a retention flat platform, we wanna focus on increased feature education and awareness throughout their experience to help improve retention. And so that strategy is really what set of principles do we want to align on in order to help accomplish our vision. And so now as you know, PM, Eng, and UX, we can brainstorm across all of our surfaces, across the full member experience, how do we increase feature education and awareness? And so one thing we notice is like, hey, many members end up canceling their sus subscription daily. And so we look at our cancel flow and say, hmm, do, do users actually know the, the full benefits they have here um, and, and why they might be canceling? And this is our old cancel flow that we had. And you notice throughout here, 
is, you know, just the very generic, why are you leaving? Oh, are you sure there's this middle dialogue that mentions something about ad free downloads? Like, but as a user, when you're ready to cancel, you're generally going to look right past this and say, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to cancel. I'm ready to stop paying for this service. And so for us, it's like, how do we highlight that more prominently so users really understand the value of the product and make sure they're making an informed decision before they leave? Um, and so, like, as I said, you, you look through this flow and you just really don't don't see much here. That's like, OK, I know for sure that I have evaluated this product fully and understand it's not the right product for me. So we rally with the team and, you know, in working with UX, working with uh, engineering um, and our crew, our full cross functional team, we said, hey, how can we design an experience that makes the benefits that I have more, um, that I increase benefit awareness and help users really understand the value of the product before they leave. And so this was the new council flow we designed, where you see in the first stage, uh, we really do bring to prominence what the value of the subscription that you've used so far. And if there's something you haven't used, we then help you understand how you might go then leverage that benefit. And so for this user, we see, okay, they've watched a, watched a lot of ad-free videos, They've downloaded 12 videos and they've played in the background a lot. However, they've yet to use our YouTube music app. And so this user may not be really understanding the full value of what they're paying for. So we wanna make sure before they leave, hey, did you know this is a benefit that we have that you haven't used yet? Go try it out. And then, you know, if that doesn't happen, if they're like, I've, I've evaluated this and I'm still, you know, fine. Then we at least wanna understand why are you leaving? You know, we've shown you what you can you can do in leverage in this product. If that wasn't the case, let's you know understand why that user is leaving, so we can help better inform and improve the product. And then we you know let the user cancel out, um, and then inform them that you will still have your benefits through the end of your last billing period. And then at that point, you will lose benefits and go back to a free user at YouTube. And so as I highlighted, we surface the benefits, have a clear, distinct survey for them to read and respond to. And then we show that like, hey, we have valued you as a, a customer uh, for our product um, and would want you to re-sign back up if your decision ever changes in the future. Um, so kind of taking a step back, we evaluated that four pieces of the framework in a very you know, accelerated manner, but we saw, okay, what was our vision what was the strategy and set of principles to help us accomplish that vision? What was the roadmap? In this case, we decided, hey, the council flow is a good project that we think could help leverage these principles in order to achieve our goals. And then on the last piece, we had to execute. So that required um, you know, me helping to define the requirements, working with UX to say, how do we then take these requirements and surface them to the user? And then third, working with our engineering uh, to make sure how do we build this in a way that's scalable uh, for our, our platform um, and also make sure it accomplishes the requirements um, that were defined earlier. And so you can see we really can't do this alone as a product manager. It requires work uh, and collaboration with engineers, UX designers, UX researchers, our marketing team, our legal department, and a lot more. And so this really is a true cross-functional role and Product managers just play one key aspect in this, but you really can't do anything without the rest of your team on board. So kind of taking a step back, how did I become a PM? When you look, speak to a lot of product managers, you will find some, you will find some patterns, but you, everyone does really have a unique journey before as to how they became a product manager. So for me, I actually did study computer engineering uh, in undergrad. And then after undergrad, I actually went to Microsoft where I was a software developer um, for Windows Phone and Windows developer platform. And so this was, what are the set of APIs and components we want in our um, SDK so that developers can build, platform, uh, can build apps for our platform. Um, after a couple of years there, I decided to go get my MBA um, because I wanted to figure out how could I complement my technical skill set with a business minded skill set as well. And I was able to use that to leverage an internship to be a PM at YouTube. And at that point, I was intern on the YouTube movies and shows team. Uh, this team is where you can, um, if you go on YouTube and search for a movie, 
like Iron Man or some TV show, you are able to rent that movie, purchase that movie to view on YouTube. After I finished my MBA program, I then came back to Google full time. I spent six months at Daydream, which is our AR VR org, and then decided to pivot to our YouTube music and premium growth team where I've been for the last two and a half years. So for you, um, for the students now, you may ask, okay, what should I be doing to help prepare myself for a career in product management? So first let's look at the skill sets you need to build. Again, one thing about product managers, they need to be able to speak the language of everyone on their team. They need to be able to have technical conversations with their engineers, design conversations with their UX designers, be able to translate these technical skill sets to, or technical and design language to your lawyers to be able to explain, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how it works. This is what the user will see. So your lawyers can help give you feedback. Um, and then also be able to talk to your marketing team. Um, and so across those skill sets, one, being able to build that technical expertise with computer science programs. Two, communication is a huge aspect of this role. You have to be able to talk to various stakeholders. You need to be able to present upwards to your management and leadership um, to help you, it, to influence and help build confidence in the projects you want to work on. Um, you need to be able to, you know, like I said, communicate with your marketing team about how do we position this product and be able to have informed conversations there. And then also thinking about strategy. You know, um, how do we take a disparate set of data, pull insights out of it, and then drive towards um, a strategy and outcomes that are helpful for the business, helpful for your users, and making sure everyone wins in the ecosystem. And so aside from the class skill set, what experiences might you look into? Um, one would be internships. Um, you know, do see if you can find internships uh, in, uh, in CS uh, programs, in product management internships to give you some experience of like what this role might look be like in all those various different flavors and see if it's the right thing for you. Second, really trying to understand and, and leverage your network to get interviews with alums. And so what you will generally find is that most people who are alums of various institutions love being able to reach back out and help uh, the next generation of students come through. And so don't feel, you know, don't have fear in being able to go to LinkedIn and say, hey, I'm looking for, you know, people who graduated from my university who work in here and send out, you know, some, some cold requests. Some of them may reply, some of them may not reply, but being able to really have conversations to learn more about what this is will help you build confidence of, do you think this is the right career? Or maybe it's an adjacent career that you might wanna pursue. And then third, personal projects. Um, you know, now that you are starting to build that technical expertise, being able to actually build a personal project, you know, surprisingly does allow you to really understand the full landscape. And so you might say, hey, I want to build an app that, you know, um, that stores my own recipes and generates a shopping list. And, you know, most people think and jump straight, you know, straight into the technical solution. But as part of that, you really have to think about, okay, what does the UI look like? Like what problem am I trying to solve? Do I want it, you know, how do I want the screens to flow? So by doing personal projects, you are actually practicing the full end to end and you will be your own PM. You might be your own UX designer, um, and then you'll be your own engineer. So you really do get all three key aspects um, of the software cycle. And then it kind of helps you understand, oh, I really loved thinking through the problem set. Or you might say, oh, that wasn't too enjoyable. Or you like say, wow, I actually love the design part of this, really thinking about how do I present this in a way that's very user friendly. Um, or you might say, I just really enjoy tackling the, the, the coding piece and thinking through all the technical uh, considerations in order to build that solution out. So sometimes personal projects are the best way if you have an idea, just to practice the full cycle and understand where, um, you know, what parts you enjoyed and what parts you didn't enjoy. And so looking at this, like I say, one, trying to build a very multifaceted skill set that really touches on all these adjacent pieces. And then second, trying to leverage experiences through interviews, internships, and working on your own personal projects can really help you understand which parts you enjoy and which parts uh, you might say, hey, this might not be a career for me. I know that was a lot, but that kind of wraps up the presentation on, you know, what is product management from my own perspective. Obviously, again, 
please feel free to, you know, reach out to other PMs because you might get a different sense um, and their own perspective of what they've gained throughout their uh, experiences. And so at this point, thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Yeah, thanks, Devin. Okay, yes, let's let's take questions. Uh, I see Trishu has his hand up. Trishu? Hi, Devin. Uh, I joined in quite late, but I have a question for you. What's the best project or the product that you've worked on yet? Ooh. Let's see. Um, I would have to say, I, I think this council flow actually would be one of the best ones. It was it was a really fun project. Um, and, and so, you know, the reason why I think one is that um, it really puts yourself in the sense of the user. Many of us have had, you know, subscriptions to various services or products that we've had to go cancel. And so sometimes you understand what that frustration is around canceling. You're like, I can't believe this is happening. I just really need to exit this, um, this service, this product. And so really it, it felt like one, I could really be in the user seat here to like empathize with the user very well to understand what might they like and what might they not like. Um, and, and so I thought that one was that user empathy part of this project was really interesting. And then also it, it actually worked very well for the business goals and the user goals we were trying to accomplish. And so it was, um, I think those components of one, it turned out to be a successful project, but two also, like I said, really building the user empathy and thinking through uh, this full problem space. And I got to work with Alex. So that was pretty dope too. Thank you. Uh, well, my second question uh, would be, uh, how do you find the best of both worlds? Like you've got an M MBA degree and also a computer engineering degree. So like, how did you manage to find the best of bo both worlds in the role that you're pursuing right now? That is an interesting question. So um, one perspective, if, if you think about product management, I said, I don't know if you saw at the beginning, but there's many different lenses it can take in terms of, you know, who's your customer, what size of company you're at and what problem, what product you're building out. Um, growth teams are a very new-ish thing in the past maybe decade within tech. Um, and so our, we take a different, you know, product perspective. And when we think about what we're building, our job is to like, how do we usher in the best Oh, am I back? Yes. All right. Um, a lot of what we do here is really think about, um, sorry, let me catch my train of thought then again. So because we are, you know, focused on how do we build a successful business, a lot of what we do is kind of based in, you know, um, looking at our subscriber growth, making sure we're building a, a, a well-balanced business. And, and also the other part is like, it's very global in nature. And so our product is launched in around 95 countries and territories. And so we really get to take a global lens on, on that perspective, which then allows us to think about what are consumer behaviors in emerging markets? Um, how do users think about paying for our product? And so I think that that particular lens which is something that I, is very unique to growth teams uh, with one of the interesting features where I thought I could combine the technical part, but really think about the strategy and business aspects in a way that most product teams may not get to, you know, actually do day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Jared has a question, go ahead. Hi, Devin. I'm Jared Washington, senior finance major at Howard University. Um, I know you talked a lot about uh, kind of managing the teams and the different aspects of owner project management, but I was, I was, I had a question on how you go about managing like the external factors. So I know like for uh, YouTube music, um, like le record label agreements might be really important or the fact that um, the app might be downloaded on an iPhone and Apple has like Apple music. So some of the features or integrations, uh, like predicting some of those feature integration on the phone. I was like wondering like the project life cycle, how you would integrate dealing with those external factors or people outside of like Google and the organization. Yes, that is a, wow, a, a very insightful question. So I, I wanna, one thing I want to, you know, clarify, you, you mentioned around management. 
And so this is a really unique thing about um, this role. I have no direct management over any of the stakeholders I work with. So like, I am not Alex's manager. I do like the UX designer does not report to me. Um, and so a lot of this role is about building influence and building alignment. And so that is one unique aspect about product management is that you can't direct anyone to build anything. It's around making sure everyone is in alignment on what we should do and then in building alignment, how do we go forward and execute that project? Um, now to your second question around the external factors. There's a lot of things you, you, you can't control. Um, and so if you, as you like, if a part of this is looking at like your, your high level strategy. And so you might think about one, um, one, I guess, framework that some people use is called a SWOT analysis, which is strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and, and threats. And so what you can do is you, by using this analysis, you're able to understand, okay, where can we do, where can we be really good? And so one thing you might say is, hey, YouTube music is, YouTube music is owned within Google, and we also have the Android platform. Are there special unique experiences we may build for, you know, YouTube music on Android that maybe other people or other, um, other companies can't replicate? Um, but also you have to say like, um, all right, we look at our peer services. So YouTube Premium is a bit of a hybrid product where sometimes we do have, you know, some of our peer services include music services, but also some of our peer services include streaming services like Disney Plus, Netflix, Hulu. And so in between this world, we look and see how do we think the, the, that industry is moving forward? Um, and then how might we position ourselves to be, um, to, to be the best product within, um, within that space for our users? Um, so, you know, one example that we saw um, is that Netflix, about a year, year ago, stopped giving out free trials. Um, so if you are, if you've never used Netflix, the only way to use it is to pay for it directly. There is no way to get a free trial. And so that was an interesting perspective where we're like, hey, Netflix was able to build such a strong brand and identity and a, a core understanding of what their product was that they no longer needed to offer trials because the word of mouth and virality of like, hey, I'm watching this show on Netflix. It's really cool. You should go check it out. People knew it's like, all right, yeah, I want to go watch this show too. Let me go sign up and pay. And so you kind of look at the industry and understand where is the, you know, where are the trends moving? And then how might we position ourselves uh, best to do so? And I think one of the unique things about working at a company like Google is that we have a full strategy team who looks at these insights for us and helps distill them into concrete, actionable, um, actionable points that then we can help take away and then adopt those into our product strategy. Thank you, Devin. That's really interesting. Especially, I, I like the part uh, you added about how maybe the product can also tie into other products. So having like the uh, YouTube music experience for Android users as well. Other questions? Uh, cool. Uh, Krishav, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I was kind of thinking because uh, the track which you followed is like kind of the same track I want to follow, but I'm not pr pretty sure on what I want to do. So you got an MBA degree from a business school. Like, do you think you're going to continue as a product manager for the rest of your life or are you going to do something different too? Great question. So actually in business school, I was deciding between two different routes. Um, one route was product management. The other route was actually venture capital. Um, and so for those who aren't aware, venture capital is um, the industry in which you are help, able to help finance companies. Um, you finance for a percentage of ownership in order for them to, to grow and build out their company with eventual hopes for them to go public. And then once um, they're able to go public, you as an investor get your returns back um, um, for, the, you know, for the ownership piece that you had. Um, and so I was really debating between those two. One was um, as a product manager, you kind of have direct, direct influence and um, ownership of the outcomes for your product, your feature. 
Whereas venture capital, it's more of an indirect influence where, you know, by enabling with financing, you then can help enable others to, you know, to reach their goals, to build their products, to build their features and grow their companies. And then you also can provide, you know, thought leadership, insight, connecting, networking and resourcing to help those companies unblock themselves and solve key problems. For me, just having been an engineer, I was, I, I really wanted that, you know, tactile piece of being able to build out features. Um, and so right now I'm very happy being a product manager. However, I, I still, you know, sometimes, um, you know, looking, you know, years down the line might consider a, a world where I move to the investing side and being able to take both my technical, you know, my technical skill set, my business and operational skill set as being a PM and then being able to leverage that. And then how do you help, you know, other companies be able to achieve their goals, but the world and the tech landscape changes so quickly that maybe in five years, what investing in, you know, financing looks like in the, the tech landscape can be very different from what it looks like right now. All right. Thank you. That was, that was, that was insightful. Thanks. Uh, Jared, yeah, go ahead. Hey, Devin. Uh, another question I had was around uh, managing, I guess, the diff or uh, helping the different groups within the team. So I know like between maybe UX designers and engineers, there might be a point where uh, the UX designers might want to do one thing, but then the capacity of the engineers might disagree and say, you know, maybe that's not the best option to do. Or like a, a budget could disagree with, you know, this is like, uh, I guess, the different areas. Uh, how do you go about managing like I wouldn't say conflicts, but like uh, different points of view uh, for the projects. That is, that is like part of the course for <laughs> what happens in this role. Um, so one thing, you know, as, as you think about it, one thing is as a PM, I think the clearer the requirements you can define, the less ambiguity it becomes in when you actually need to execute and then build out uh, whatever you need. However, at the end of the day, you, you're not going to be perfect. There's always going to be something where it's like, hmm, we could go path A or path B. And really what you have to do is evaluate what are the goals you're trying to achieve at that time. So for instance, you might say, hey, our job right now is to optimize for speed to market. We need to get something in front of users and learn. So what the trade-off I might make at that point might be, excuse me, hey, I think idea B is wonderful, but idea B is going to take us three weeks to do where idea A takes us one week. Right now, we can't afford to take three weeks to do this, so we should go with option um, A. Or, you know, at the same time, you might say, um, you, you might look at, okay, we want to make sure this is the best experience for the user. And so, you know, taking that same example, the, the longer project might take might be worth the trade-off for either, you know, making sure, you know, user comprehension is there, user satisfaction is there, helping us achieve the business goal that we set out to do. And so really you have to evaluate this on a case-by-case -case basis. But I, I found the one thing is if you can, if you have a, um, a clear defined rationale for why you make a decision, it is helpful to align you know, your engineer and your UX designer. So one, you wanna make sure everyone feels heard that the ideas were presented and respectfully considered. But two, as a PM, you you have the 360 view landscape of, oh, is this gonna be a legally sensitive thing if we do this? Or, hey, like I say, do we need to get this out the door tomorrow? Or I think actually this option will be better for users. And so that's where you can bring in that full uh, 360 picture and then help articulate a, a strong, clear rationale and then make a decisive decision. Um, and I think that is one of the key skill sets that as a PM you're always going to, you're going to, ref to get better at is how do you make decisions um, that are clear, that are you know, decisive and that they help align and bring you know, your team forward to the next stage. It's not that those decisions will always be right. You're going to be wrong a lot of the times and that is okay. But the key is you need to be able to make a decision and help, um, you know, unblock your team and move forward. And at Google, we have a principle called like disagree and commit. So it's not that everyone's going to necessarily agree with every decision you make, but it's around like, hey, 
I, I hear you. I don't agree with this, but if this is the path we need to take forward, I will commit to making that plan and then we can revisit this at a later time. Yeah, I, I want to add some more color too, because I'm another I I I, I yeah, please do. happens. <laughs> the fact that like especially when you're working with passionate people. I mean, I mean, you guys have seen how, like me teaching and everything, like the things I do, I, I tend to be passionate about. And a lot of people at Google are like that. So you have passionate people, they're opinionated. So something Devin does really well and in general product managers need to be good at is like the social side of um, uh, when like I make my opinions on something known or I think, hey, no, we should do this differently. Like I don't agree with this. Devin like really listens to it and considers it. And there have been times where he's been like, oh yeah, you're right. Like we should take this approach. And so there's a lot of like social aspect to it where we've now built up the trust, like like Devin properly, I know Devin always respectfully considers my ideas. There are times when they are a good idea and that we should go with it. Um, and we've done that. But there are other times where Devin has like more information or he can kind of explain, oh, no, 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 like this is like legally sensitive. We can't really take this approach. There's risk here that maybe as an engineer, you don't realize, but Devin's kind of communicating with all these different parties and has a different view, a different landscape. And so that trust is really important. That's part of what makes him a successful PM is he, he's very good at building those relationships. <clears throat> well, thank you. Really helpful. Um, other questions, uh, uh, Richard, I'll call on you in a second. Uh, just wanted to see uh, Mary or Jamar. Again, my, no pressure, but yeah, if anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand. No. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead, Richard. Oh, Jamar, actually, but let's see Jamar's question first. Yeah, um, I just have a different question. So um, as you already know, I was at also at the, um, the SRE talk. So from what I learned, like this, all of that, I was wondering if there was like a, if Google had like some sort of like guide or book, like I know that they have like um, a book or that um, gives like a general synopsis of SRE and what kind of work uh, SREs do. I was wondering if there was something similar on the Google website for product managers. I'm, I'm not too sure off the top of my head, what we can do with Alex, let's follow up after the meeting and I can go like ask our, you know, recruiting department, what might be available uh, publicly for. My, for my, my guess, Jamar, would be probably not. And here's why. The role that a product manager plays, even within Google, varies so much from hardware teams to products, like uh, to like consumer product teams like YouTube to like B2B teams. Uh, and it, that varies even more as you look at what they do in startups or what they do at different size companies. And so an SRE, they're like these standard practices, very standard things that you focus on as an SRE. It's a little bit broader as a suite because there are different kinds of engineering, but I imagine for product managers, it's even wider. Um, I don't know, Devin, do you, do you agree with that? I, I agree. And I, I think that's why even when I was doing research to try to find a, a good distilled definition, you just, it, it, it's all over the place. Um, and, and I think, you know, to the points that you just articulated, I say I can definitely take a, an action to look it up and see if I can find anything uh, internally that we share out. And if so, I'll, I'll send it through Alex to send back to y'all. Um, okay, I, I need to stop the re recording here. So let's give uh, Devin a round of applause. Thank you, Devin, for coming to talk to us. Uh, Thank you all for having me. Really, really excited to be here and, you know, um, wishing y'all a successful end to this, I guess, semester. Um, and, you know, as maybe a successful start to your uh, CS, uh, PM, UX uh, tech careers. Devin, and, and if students uh, want to reach out, is there, do you want them to just reach out to me or is, uh, you know? Have them reach out to you and then we can try to consolidate the, the request in and then, um, you know, figure out the right way to field them. Great, yeah. So if anyone has any kind of follow-up questions for Devin, you guys know how to reach me, um, uh, Alex Dark. Gmail, yeah, just reach out. Okay, thank you. Thanks, y'all. Y'all have a good one.